Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the Graduate Virtual Fair in American Studies here at Penn State Harrisburg. My name is Mitchell Patterson, and I'm the Associate Director for Graduate Admissions. Uh, joining us today, we have, to do, we have Dr. John Haddad, Hi, who teaches in the School of, hi, Dr. Haddad, teaches in the School <laughs> of Humanities and serves as the professor in charge of the American Studies program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. And we also have an alum of the program, uh, Jamie Kinsley, who is a ninth grade teacher at the Milton Hershey School who teaches cultural studies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, joining, uh, thank you, Jamie, for joining us today. So before we get underway, Dr. Haddad, uh, can you just give a little overview about your work here in American Studies? I know you do both disciplines with PhD as right. well as the MA, but since we're talking about the MA, can you go a little bit further about your studies or your teaching within the American Studies sure, MA? Sure. Um, Happy to. So I uh, am the chair of the American Studies program. We have a PhD, uh, a bachelor's degree for undergrads, and the MA, which is, of course, the feature today. Um, I teach uh, courses in uh, American popular culture, uh, U.S. literature, uh, American cultural history and, and research methods, and Asian American studies uh, as well. Uh, and in my research, I look at America's historical relationship with China. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Haddad. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jamie, why did you select the American Studies program? I know it, it ties into what you're doing as a teacher, but uh, what was the intricacy behind this program? Yeah, um, so I'm a teacher at Milton Hershey School and I teach ninth graders and I was looking at a master's program. So I checked out Penn State, uh, the American Studies program, and I was looking for three big things. Um, the first is I wanted to expand my content because the at the main at the end of the day the main point is to teach your kids what you learn. So I wanted to find something that was ap applicable to many different things that I taught cover in class. Um, the second reason why I wanted to join this master's program is because I didn't want to get into one niche field. I didn't want to just be a historian or just be a writer or just get into uh, literature. I wanted to be able to talk about many different things like popular culture, anthropology, folklore, but then also history as well. Um, and the last thing is kind of selfish. I have, have a lifestyle. I work full time. I live an hour away from the school and I need to commute. Um, I have friends and family. And so I needed something that I could get done in a, in a couple of years and something that wouldn't drag on. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Jamie. That's uh, again, that that is, I guess, the genesis behind American studies uh, in terms of it gives you a spectrum of many different concentrations. That's right. I mean, you are our ideal applicant in the sense that you're not interested in one thing. You're interested in looking at American culture in a holistic way. So not just history, not just literature, but but film and, and art and the environment and, and the connections between mm -hmm. all of them. Which Perfect. the American Studies program allows you to do. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, that serves as our segue yep. into a presentation that Dr. Haddad has prepared for us. So for our viewing audience, um, we're going to move into that portion of uh, the virtual fair. So without further ado, Dr. Haddad. OK, great. All right, there's the, uh, the master's program in American studies. Uh, and uh, I've set up this slideshow kind of anticipating the questions of, of folks who are interested in, uh, in applying. So I did it in kind of a question answer format. So let's let's begin. Well, the, we've kind of gotten to that already <laughs> a little bit. Uh, what is American studies? It's a question that, that a lot of people uh, ask because it's a field that doesn't exist at the high school level, at least not frequently. So people don't get exposed to it until college or graduate school. Um, and uh, this slide kind of covers it, and uh, J Jamie already covered it, but it's a, an interdisciplinary field. Uh, we look at America's past and present, and we do it in a lot of different ways all at the same time. Uh, it is related to, but quite different from history and English, the two more conventional fields. Uh, it's like history in the sense that we also explore the American past, However, we don't focus as much on things like just wars and presidents and acts of Congress. Yes, there's some of that, but we look more deeply into the, the culture itself. We look at uh, film and, and art and, and uh, literature. Um, and in, in many ways, we're similar to English. Um, like, an, like an English program, we value the novel. We think novels have a lot of cultural information. But we're always going to understand a novel by situating it in its historical context and asking 
what's going on in uh, in science at that time, in religion, in 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 politics, or in the economy. Uh, so another way to think of American studies is that it offers a wide-angle view of American culture. We look at you know all those things you see listed in the slide there: movies, music. We have a sports history class. Uh, we value children's culture, uh, folklore, food ways, religion, art and architecture, digital culture, science and technology, and consumer cu culture. You know, what can we learn about about the American people by the way they shop? Uh, I found that uh, the best way to explain the field is to choose a prime example. Um, and, and you see Disneyland up there. And um, I think everyone would agree that Disneyland is a, is a venue of great cultural significance. Um, and yet, when you ask yourself, well, okay, it's important, but what academic field would study Disneyland? History? Well, they might. They might talk about it for a few minutes. Uh, English, probably not. So here you have something of massive importance and there's no academic field that really looks at it. Well, that's American studies. We would take Disneyland very seriously and we would interpret it almost like an English major would interpret a novel. We go in and we look at, we would look at the rides or the different lands and you can see those on the slide, you know, frontier land and adventure land and tomorrow land. And we would talk about how Disneyland generates mythologies and, and legends that are meaningful to the American people. Uh, Disneyland opened in, in the 1950s, right smack dab in the middle of the Cold War. So we talk about how Cold War politics may be woven into the fabric of Disneyland and how it became almost a rite of passage for children. This is a question I get a lot. Um, you know, uh, uh, I didn't study American studies when I was in college, uh, so I don't know the past all that well. Should I still apply? Would I belong in your program? And the answer is absolutely not. Go somewhere else. <laughs> <Yeah>. no, I, <laughs> uh, no, of course we want you. And in fact, we view the fact that you did not major in American studies as a strength. Uh, I think Jamie would agree, you know, our, our master's students uh, come from a variety of backgrounds, and that's a strength of the program, not a weakness. Because in any given seminar, there's somebody who knows history well, somebody else who knows education or anthropology or psychology. And so they have something to say. They have a unique perspective or, or area of training that they can uh, uh, use to contribute to the discussion of that day. So uh, we like intellectual diversity. So whatever your background is, I think you're going to have a home here, and I think you'll make a valuable contribution. Still, though, uh, some students feel like they would like to catch up on the history, and we've anticipated that. A lot of our classes are designed to expose you to American cultural history from the far past to the present. We offer classes on the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, and even the 21st century, though it's only about two decades old, it's a a lot has happened already in this mm -hmm. in this century, and the class also looks projects towards the future. So, if you don't have a historical background, but you'd like to acquire history, um, you could take the century sequence. You can also fill other gaps in your in your knowledge. Uh, we have classes on gender and culture, on race and ethnicity. Uh, literature class and, and American art, among others. And master's students can also fill gaps in other ways. They are allowed to take upper division undergraduate courses or 400 level courses. And I'm not going to review all these, but uh, we, we offer a lot of classes at the 400 level that master's students are allowed to take. And, and so these classes and a wide range of subjects can uh, contribute to your, to your MA degree program. How many credits is the program? Well, one thing I love about the masters, and if we were talking about the PhD, Mitchell, it would be different, because that is a complicated, necessarily so, but a complicated <laughs> program. The master's program is delightfully simple. Okay. It's 30 credits. And uh, of those 30 credits, there are three required classes. So nine of the 30 credits are prescribed. American Studies 500, 591, and 580. The other 21 credits are up to you. You chart your own course with the help of an advisor. 
and those classes, um, America Studies 500, we call that the gateway seminar. Jamie, you remember taking that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't even know what American Studies was at that point, but this class got you up to speed. It introduced you to the history of the field, its various methods and tools, and where it's at now. So that gets everyone on the same page. Everybody passes through this gateway so they know the basics on American Studies. Uh, we are going to have you write a thesis, and we don't assume that you automatically know how to develop a project and, and conduct research. So there is an entire class dedicated to teaching you how to do serious high-level research in American Studies. And that's American Studies 591. Usually students take that near the end of their program of study. That thesis is 580. This is a three credit class, but it's not really a class where you meet with, uh, with fellow students. Instead, you're working with your advisors one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, to knock out the chapters of your thesis. <coughs> um, you, most students will write a, a conventional thesis. Jamie, is that what you did? Yeah, yeah, I wrote a thesis, but you don't have to. You yeah, you don't a have to. As well. You can do a project as well. So some people uh, want to, um, they have ideas to share, but they don't want to communicate those in the conventional thesis format. Um, and so they can do a project. They might uh, do, say, a museum exhibit. Um, uh, they might, uh, if, they are, if they want to become teachers, they might design a whole teaching module. Uh, they could, uh, we've had short story writers and poets. Uh, they might uh, create a portfolio of their creative work. Uh, someone with a communications background could create a documentary. So there's lots of ways that you can knock out America Studies 580 uh, by doing a project rather than a conventional thesis. Uh, we also have certificate programs. Uh, we have two certificate programs. We have one in heritage and museum practice and one in folklore and ethnography. Uh, we've always had uh, courses in museum studies, and we've always had classes in folklore and ethnography, but we created these certificates not long ago because we realized that uh, students wanted to not only get the training, but have a credential. Uh, it was, it was, I guess it was kind of hard for people to go out into the job market with, with the American Studies master's degree and have to explain mm -hmm. that they also say, you know, knew how to, to organize a museum exhibit. So these certificates fill that need. Now you may wonder, why are we talking about a certificate in a, uh, in a video session dedicated to a master's program? Well, that's because you can do the certificate by itself and it's 15 credits, but most students prefer to do it as a part of their master's degree. So each certificate, whether it's folklore or the museum studies one, they're 15 credits and they overlap with your master's coursework. So remember, the master's degree is 30 credits. So if you wanted to also do a certificate, you could, it could be folded into your master's degree. Uh, so your grand total would be 30 credits, not 45 credits, and you would graduate with a master's in American studies and let's say a certificate in, uh, in heritage and museum practice or in folklore and ethnography. That's exactly what I did. Oh, that's right. You did, you did uh, folklore and yeah. ethnography. Is that right? Yeah, I just mixed it in. Yeah. They allow you to kill two birds with one stone. Yes. Yeah, make it work for you. Yes. And you took a lot of classes on ethnography, which you then used in your master's mm -hmm. thesis. Yeah. Very, very good. Uh, so there is a, here's a slide on the, on the Heritage Museum Practice Certificate, 15 credits. And this prepares students for careers in, say, tourism, museums, uh, archives, historic homes, battlefields. Uh, students have had careers in such places or internships in, in uh, places like Gettysburg. Uh, of, you know, there's a lot of sites of historical and cultural interest in this area. The area is rich indeed. And folklore and ethnography, very similar, also 15 credits. And uh, this certificate prepares students for careers in festivals and arts councils, uh, community organizations, governmental agencies, and cultural conservation, as well as archiving and media production. The $10 million question. Absolutely. I suspect, Mitchell, this is what you get uh, when people come to your office more than any other question. What do students do with the degree? 
What can you do with an American studies degree? Lots of good things. Uh, you can, like Jamie here, you can uh, uh, go into education. Uh, a lot of our graduates are now teaching in high schools, colleges, or, or overseas. Yes, you can teach in, a, in many overseas colleges with a master's degree. That's where I got my early uh, teaching experience. I taught in China after getting my master's degree. Um, and um, you know, you could do the master's before you start teaching, but you, a lot of uh, people like Jamie, Jamie was already at the Milton Hershey mm -hmm. School when she joined the master's program. So you can uh, improve your status at your current school mm -hmm. by, by, by doing the master's. I mentioned tourism. Uh, public history, a uh, place like museums and battlefields. Uh, a lot of our graduates go into government, uh, the nonprofit sector, and drum roll, please. <laughs> you could see the master's program as the stepping stone to a PhD program, and that's exactly what what Jamie did. Uh, that's it for my slideshow, but I want to uh, extend an offer. Uh, I really just uh, went over the basics here. If you'd like to have an in-depth talk about you and your interests and how those might align with the program, uh, I encourage you to send me an email or give me a call and we will set up a, a nice hour when you can come in uh, and talk about the program. If you live far away, we'll talk by phone. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Haddad. That was a very, very thought-provoking and impactful, comprehensive, the, the word I would think about, uh, presentation about the American Studies Program. And I, I'm looking ahead on, on the table. You have some really cool textbooks that really ties into what American Studies does offer. I'm actually going to pivot to Jamie because you, you, you've given a lot of information. So I want to hear uh, Jamie's perspective from a student in terms of what was the, the classes like, um, seminar style, online learning by way of earning your master's degree. So um, I took, they're all night classes, which makes it uh, helpful for those of us who work full time. So they're one day a week, usually from six to nine. And there's a lot of flexibility in picking your classes. Like Dr. Haddad said, you only have to take three. So that means if you're really not into race and ethnicity, you don't have to take those classes. A lot of choice and agency. Um, when you go to the class, usually it's about 15 students. Um, and it's extremely diverse, not only in our backgrounds, but also in ages. There are people in your classes that are going to be 21, the whole way up to, I think I had someone in our class that was like in their 60s. Yeah, imagine We've that. had students. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so they've like, had their careers already. And right. They really want to return to school kind of right. for just cultural edification. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah, and for those of you who like planning, they give you the syllabus right in the beginning, so you know what you have to do. Usually there are writing that you have to do throughout the semester, but then at the end of the year, end of the semester, there's a capstone paper that you have to write that's about 15 pages long. But you know from the beginning what you have to do. Well, uh, staying with that, you mentioned a capstone paper and Haddad, you had talked about a, a thesis. I know a lot of graduate school students are always looking to do publication. Mm -hmm. So how does that translate where, hey, I, I saw from the PowerPoint, there's a 50 to 80 page thesis that I have to do. Can I have a, an opportunity or is, is there an opportunity to have that published and from there present that at a conference? What does that look like? Yeah, we we hope that a, um, you know, a paper that, that you, a student writes in a class or a thesis that, that she writes to get her degree, that, um, that it will have an audience beyond the, one, the, the professor or the, uh, the readers of the thesis. We want, you know, we want your research to have a life well beyond the classroom here. Um, and so we encourage students to seek out other venues um, and, and publishing opportunities for their research. Uh, we have here uh, in the region something called Eastern American Studies. This is a conference where you've presented mm -hmm. there at least once, maybe mm -hmm. more than once. Oh. So it's a it's a regional conference in American Studies that is very student oriented. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone can present there. You know, professors, uh, 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 professionals, anyone can present there. But we tend to have a lot of graduate students, and it's a place for them to get uh, real experience presenting their research at a conference. And sometimes that can lead to uh, publishing opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in the uh, the research methods class, we we try to demystify the whole publishing uh, process. Uh, explain how how is it that someone's research ends up in an academic journal? Well, we talk about how you would approach find the right journal, how you would approach them. 
uh, how you would polish your your research to make it something that they would want to publish. So, uh, it's it's an excellent question, Mitchell, and it's something that we're that we're really focused on in the program. Pretty good. I can speak to that too. Sure. <clears throat> um, I wrote a paper for a class. On, uh, on chickens, because I'm interested in raising chickens, and I thought, I wonder what other people do when they raise chickens. And so I ended up writing a paper on companion species. And when I sent it in for publication, it got denied, which happens. Um, so then the next class, I met with a professor, and I asked Dr. Charity Fox, and I said, I'd like to expand this paper. Can I interview more people, go more in depth than she allowed me to? So I could take that one paper, develop it. I sent it in and did get published, which is really awesome. Um, but it was because the professors understand that you have this really neat idea and you want to grow instead of just always having to jump around to something different. That's right. I, and, and staying with that, Jamie, <clears throat> am I correct in saying you, you do a lot of food study, mm -hmm. right? So can you talk about why, what's, what's the attraction for you with, with concentration in food studies? Um, yeah, so I look at people who homestead specifically in York County, and I think it's because I really am interested in community, uh, and I also homestead as well. So there's a little bit of an intrinsic desire to understand the self, a lot of self-exploration that goes into the American Studies program. So when I first started, I didn't quite know what I wanted to get into. I took a material culture class with Dr. Bronner, uh, and he, he dissected a chicken coop. And I thought, okay, <laughs> all right, I can do this. Um, and so every single class that I've taken here, I've been able to look at homesteading from different lenses every single time is something different, whether it's literature or um, people or even class, gender. Um, but I can research what, what I'm interested in. Yeah, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a special feature of our program is we never try to impose, like I'm a professor here, I never try to impose my research mm -hmm. interests onto a student. Instead, you try to work with a student and find out what, what he or she is interested in. So for Jamie, it was homesteading. Um, and for other students, it might be, it might be comics. Uh, for somebody else, it might be film. Uh, uh, someone might want to study a president. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, you name it, uh, material culture, the, or the objects of everyday life, mm -hmm. uh, food ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so the students usually come with an interest in mind and they use the, the seminars to, to start taking their interest and converting that into something of serious academic study. And then perhaps at the end of their degree program, they write a thesis on that. And, they've, and, and at that point, they've contributed new knowledge to the world when they've written that thesis. So something began with just an interest in, let's say, how do people grow their own food? And it becomes uh, a work of serious research that in your case ends, ends up in a published journal. Well, and even my thesis when I finished, I didn't quite felt I didn't feel satisfied mm -hmm. that I explored the entire topic. So I looked into the PhD program, and I never thought I would get a PhD. I come from a working class family, and I thought, ah, those are for those smart people that can afford it. When I looked in the program, the master's program prepared me for it, and I was able to uh, to take the next step in my career. So, w with that being said, I want to piggyback on that because this is a question mm -hmm. for both of you. Uh, you you listed Dr. Haddad about the transition from an MA to a PhD in American Studies. What does that look like? And I also want to hear from you, Jamie, by way of now as a, a participant, as a member within the PhD track. So 30 credits to get the MA, will it all roll over to the PhD? So give us the formula in terms of how it works. Right, so we, all, we have a lot of really good master's students and sometimes like Jamie, they decide that they want to take the next step, uh, both in their research and in their teaching. Um, Perhaps they want to become a college professor, for sure. example. Um, and um, you know, if as long as they've done well in the in the master's program, uh, we encourage them to apply to the PhD. Now it's a completely separate program, uh, so that you know the master's is thirty credits, uh, the PhD is about thirty six credits, and nothing really rolls over except that we don't ask you to take the same classes again. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, you know. Jamie, I, I, I can't remember, but you had taken theory and methods, the gateway class. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, if, and if you had taken that really recently uh, when you joined the PhD, we wouldn't make you take the same class again. Um, um, but it is, it's a completely different program, but um, we, we really look favorably upon students who have done good work in the master's program like Jamie. Very good. So Jamie, being in the program, how has it been so far? Because again, you, you You've conquered the first goal with earning the, the master's in American mm -hmm. studies. So now 
is there a difference? Do you feel that there's a, an, a difference within the academic rigor as a PhD student? Um, yes, um, but what's great about the, the program here is that it's what you make it. And you can go in and take the minimum amount of classes and just show up from six to nine, or you can really dive deep uh, and meet different people um, within the program, whether it is creating a cohort or some type of connection. Uh, and it will eventually lead to other things, not even just a PhD, but in the community. Mm -hmm. For example, I wrote a paper on a, a local farm to table for that one of my classes uh, for my master's. And I sent it in to the local editor of uh, the history journal that's in New York. And again, he declined, but he said, <laughs> you're a great writer. You love New York. You love history. Why don't you start a blog? And so I now blog for the local newspaper. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't learn the skills of the master's program of reading and writing and interviewing people, um, even digital studies, there's digital study classes mm -hmm. to go online. Uh, that wouldn't have happened. And, and not to mention the confidence, the master's program, you, you learn stuff. So you can talk to people about general, I mean, all different kinds of things. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, I, I wanna come back to you, Dr. Haddad. Um, this program has been around for more than 20 years, am I correct? I, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna guess even more like 30 About to 30 40. years, yeah. yeah. One of the earlier programs within American Studies, when you, yeah. when you think about the brand itself. So what's the, the, the link or the connection that Penn State Harrisburg has within South Central Pennsylvania through the lens of American studies. Right, uh, you know, when Penn State wanted to create an American studies program, again, many decades ago, uh, it could have chosen uh, University Park, State College, but they chose this area, because this region is just wonderful for cultural studies. Uh, you know, I like State College a lot, but, there's, but here you have government, here you have lots of museums, you have the Amish, uh, um, you have Gettysburg, you know, there's just right. so many in mm -hmm. you, you know, York and all the festivals mm -hmm. that York has. You have so many things going on there that um, it's, it's a not great region. Carlisle. And let's not forget, <laughs> you're forget stomping Carlisle, right? around uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Right. Army War College. Yeah, there's plenty of history in Carlisle. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, this region is well populated and it's culturally rich. So Penn State decided, and I think wisely so, that it was the this was the, the perfect location for American studies. And we have students, you know, we have of course we have classes, and a lot of your time here, if you came, would be spent in seminars or in the library. But we have lots of internships, and master students can do internships. You know, Jamie here has done internships that force you to go out into the community and make connections and use the skills or use the learning that you that you have acquired in the classroom and learn new skills from that site or that museum or whatever it whatever it is and sometimes it even leads to great opportunities like you're now a blogger for a you know for it for local your, newspaper yeah your yeah. newspaper well that's because our professors get to know the students on an individual basis um that it was a dr cuffer he said i met the ceo down in the history center in york i think you should intern there and he said it's in the archives and i thought oh my summer in the archives that doesn't sound fun but i learned all <laughs> these new skills and met again people and social capital is because they take time to get to know you wow that's fantastic uh, we, again we I oftentimes ask this question because the question is asked of me. Mm. So how does funding streams work sure. by way of paying for graduate school? Right, so we have uh, in the master's program, we have full-time and part-time, and we have students who are funded and students who are self-paying. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing funding, uh, I would say get in touch with the chair of the program and indicate your interests, um, and you're going to need to take the GRE test. So if you're just applying, if you just want admission and you don't seek funding, you do not need the GRE. Right. But if you do want to be considered for a funding package, you need the GRE test. Um, there's two kinds of funding packages that, that Penn State Harrisburg offers. Uh, there's one called a GA, a graduate assistantship, whereby you would receive a stipend um, and tuition for, for free. And in exchange, you would owe the School of Humanities, where American Studies is, 
uh, 20 hours a week. And we have you doing various projects that I think are good for your professional development. We don't have you making coffee or running up, you know, <laughs> doing the Xerox machine. You know, we, we, we have you doing things that are good for you. You might TA for a class or work with a professor on his or her research project. Or uh, one of our professors is, uh, is uh, the editor of a journal, so you can help in the editorial work. Or help me organize uh, the Eastern American Studies Conference. So work like that. So you would owe 20 hours per week in exchange for your funding. There's also a funding package now called a GWA. And uh, that one is, um, it, it won't fund your entire program of study. Um, um, it will give you about eleven dollars or $12,000 a year, uh, which will cover a lot of your tuition. And in exchange, you would work uh, for 20 hours in the same way as, as, the, as the GA. So you would have to be here full time for that. You would have to be here full time to do either one. And what does full time look like? Full time looks like nine credits, three classes. Okay. And uh, usually a full time student can do the entire master's program in two semesters plus a little extra, like taking summer classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, in terms of the campus community, how has that been on your level, Jamie, doing your master's degree? Do you find that there's a camaraderie within the School of Humanities and support from advising? I mean, it sounds like there is, but I want to hear from you as uh, an alum. We kind of program. leave them alone. Leave them alone. <laughs> they do their own thing. Isolating right. experience. Yeah, so. yeah the, the exact opposite. Um, like I said before, it's kind of what you make it. If you want to work and then just come into class uh, one day a week, that's great. But there's also a, a deep sense of community and camaraderie and support. There's not in class this type of competition where you look at your A and the person beside you has a B and you think that you're somehow better. There's nothing like that. It's nothing but um, support. But then also, I mean, we, we push each other. Um, there we developed our own little cohort where a couple of us, and this was not from the institution. This was just one of my friends said, let's get together. We formed a writing group. So we meet once a week, every Wednesday. We're actually going to meet here in a couple of hours. Right. Um, and we just look at over each other's papers. Last week, it was someone's resume. Uh, and and sure. who does that? Who is in your same program that looks at your resume and shows you where the gaps are that you can try to uh, market yourself better in a couple of years when you're in the job market? All right. Like I said, th this is a great feature of the program is it's not real competitive. Like Jamie just said, this, th it's not as if, um, you know, the program is trying to weed out strong students of, or, or weed out weak students. So only the strong survive. Nothing like that mm -hmm. at all. If we accept you, we are dedicated to your success. We want to help you get where you need to go. Um, and all the students recognize that. So they're not in competition with each other. So they're all on the same page here, or they're all really uh, uh, as part of the same effort to help everybody self-actualize. Right. Excellent. Well, that's, that's reassuring to know <laughs> for students that are considering this program. Well, that brings the, uh, the roundtable discussion to a close. So. I want to lead off in hearing from both of you why the American Studies MA program. Yeah, uh, I've been here for 15 years and I love the program and I, I like several things about it. I love its flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, students come in with such different interests. Some want to study race and ethnicity. Some want to study sports history. Some want to study movies. Um, some want to do folklore. Others want to want to work in the 18th century. Uh, we can accommodate you regardless of your interests. So incredible flexibility. An another hallmark of the program is that we have seven faculty me members who are dedicated to the program and to its students. Uh, there are American Studies models out there where there's no such, there are no American Studies faculty. There are English professors who teach a class in American right. Studies. There's history professors who teach a class in American Studies. Sociology, they teach a class. Um, that's a different model. We, we have a model where every professor is dedicated to American Studies. So we're there, you know, all week, every week, uh, trying to help students like Jamie get ahead. Mm -hmm. So we care, we care passionately about the program and uh, we, we enjoy working with the students. Like Jamie said, you know, the coursework is interesting, but a lot of the cool stuff happens outside the coursework where you're, it's just a, a student uh, in a professor's office talking about possibilities, talking about uh, research topics, talking about publications or conferences or, or neat internships. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of the exciting opportunities take place. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dad. And Jamie. 
I have to echo everything Dr. Haddad said, um, the community, the support, um, the also transparency that tell you up front everything that you need to do. There's no surprises. You can plan out your entire program today if you wanted to. Um, the only other thing I would add are the skills that you develop are extremely competitive. You learn how to research legitimately and write. Um, they don't just give you a paper back that says you get a B without explanations. Every professor spends hours, even Dr. Haddad's line edited. Uh, my paper is telling you what you can do to improve and you can even sometimes submit it for a, a higher score. Um, so th those skills have helped me in a lot of different areas of my life. Glad you liked all that line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not all studying. students do. Looks like it was bleeding it sometimes. <laughs> okay. Well, that concludes the program for today. We want to thank you, Dr. Haddad, for uh, giving us some wonderful information about the American Studies Program uh, master's degree track here. And Jamie, for participating as an alum. Uh, you're doing great things. Thank so you. you make the program proud. Thanks. You make us proud here. And thank you for joining us. And have a great afternoon.